Well, good morning again. Uh, if you're just coming uh, into this sermon series, we have been preaching through the book of Acts uh, since Pentecost. Pentecost is the birthday of the church because it's the time when God poured out his Holy Spirit for the first time in a measureless and permanent way on all believers. And he has been fully available to believers ever since. I want to make a claim today as we continue through this series that when the church is empowered by the Holy Spirit, perseveres through persecution, crosses borders of separation, moves forward against unpopularity, and finds opportunities and struggles, that the church can change culture. The church can actually change the culture. In our passage for today, Luke writes in the book of Acts about Paul living and sharing the kingdom of God. We see something happen as a result. The culture in which Paul is serving and living begins to change. This is the account from Acts 19, verses 8 through 12 and 18 through 20. I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. Paul went to the synagogue and spoke confidently for the next three months. He interacted with those present and offered convincing arguments concerning the nature of God's kingdom. Some people had closed their minds, though. They refused to believe and publicly slandered the way. As a result, Paul left them, took the disciples with him, and continued his daily interactions in Tyrannus' lecture hall. This went on for two years so that everyone living in the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, Heard the Lord's word. God was doing unusual miracles through Paul. Even the small towels and aprons that had touched his skin were taken to the sick, and their diseases were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Many of those who had come to believe came confessing their past practices. This included a number of people who practiced sorcery. They collected their sorcery texts and burned them publicly. The value of those materials was calculated at more than someone might make if they worked for 165 years. In this way, the Lord's word grew abundantly and strengthened powerfully. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been to Baskin Robbins? I know we don't have someone like, yes, amen. Amen. Confessing our past, past practices. Was that in the text? Yes. There's, uh, there's not a Baskin Robbins around here anymore, and I grieve that. There is one in Pensacola. I know exactly where it is. But one thing I love about Baskin Robbins is when you go in, of all the ice cream places, when you go in, there's this cup that sits on top of the ice cream bar, and as you're looking through the glass to decide which of their 31 flavors you want, This cup is full of small pink spoons. Amen. And they will let you sample whichever ones you want before you buy anything. I have filled up before just on pink spoon samples. It is remarkable. The reason I mention this to you today is because... Sometime back, I read a book called Static by Ron Martoya, and he talks about how Jesus went around handing out pink spoon samples of the kingdom of God. See, when Jesus came, I don't know if you realize this, but we live in a period that some scholars have called the already not yet. The already not yet. So in some sense, what God's people had waited for for a long, long time has already come in Jesus. The kingdom has been inaugurated, but the kingdom has not been consummated. Now, those are big words. It means the kingdom has already come, but it's not yet fully in place of everything that it will be in place of when Jesus comes again. So we live in the already, not yet. And what Jesus did to show that was he went around handing out samples of the kingdom. He brought the kingdom with him. And then he looked at his disciples and he said, you are citizens of this kingdom. He called people to live in the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, even as they remained residents of this world. 
pink spoon samples of the kingdom are still being handed out. And one promise that Jesus gave that I love is he said, you will do even more and greater things than you have seen me do. Even more and even greater samples of the kingdom will come because of those who follow me. I'm going to ask you to talk this morning, and I'm going to tell you what to say. You don't have to think of what to say to your neighbor because I know some of us have social anxiety, myself included. But I want you to turn to someone next to you, and I want you to say, I want a pink spoon sample. Can you say that? Go ahead. What all are you saying? <laughs> I don't think it would take that long. Okay. Some of you are very, some of you don't struggle with social anxiety at all. Praise God. It's good to be with the people of God. You see, a pink spoon sample is not enough to quench your appetite, but it's enough of a taste to tell you, I want more. I want the whole bowl. I now have this taste in my mouth, and I'm not going to be satisfied until I get the whole thing. That's what a pink spoon sample of the kingdom of God does for us. We want more, and it causes us to invite God to give us more, and we remember the promise of Jesus that says, let all who hunger come to me, and I will satisfy you so that you never hunger again, for I am the bread of life. The kingdom of God is delicious. It's the church's job to hand out pink spoon samples. Now, I want you to turn back to the same person. This is the last time, I promise. And I want you to say, I want to hand out pink spoon samples. Go ahead. <laughs> Some of you are sandwiched in the middle of two people talking, and you don't know when you're going to get your turn. <laughs> it's all right. We all have a chance to hand out pink spoon samples. So this is a nice image, right? But what does this look like? What does this mean? In practical terms, what does it mean to hand out samples of the kingdom? What does it look like in the world? Well, I think Jesus answered that. How we apply it is up for imagination. But Jesus came in Luke 4, and, and if you remember, he stood up in the temple one day, and he, he was invited to read Scripture because they would invite rabbis to read Scripture, and they would hand you the text for the day. And he was handed of all texts the Isaiah scroll. And he opened it up in Luke 4, and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now some of those sound very literal, and they are. Jesus literally delivered people from physical blindness. But did you know that when Jesus talked about blindness, it wasn't always literal? He accused people of being blind and said that the Lord would not open their eyes because they have turned from his ways. The church is called to open the eyes of the blind, to proclaim release to prisoners. And we know that prisons come in many forms, do they not? to bring liberation to the oppressed, to give hope to the despairing, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that God's reign of debt forgiving and favor has finally come, and we carry that message. Jesus said we are to be salt, light, and leaven. Listen to what he tells his followers in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on a lampstand, and it shines for all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. Then Jesus says about the kingdom of God in Matthew 13, 33, as he's telling them a parable, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, which a woman took and hid in a bushel of wheat flour until the yeast had worked its way through all the dough. The kingdom of God is like a little pinch of yeast. And when you put it in this large batch of dough so that you can't even really see it anymore, it is so 
hidden and seemingly insignificant, it changes the whole thing. This is the kingdom of God. And if we are those who are citizens of the kingdom of God, that is the effect we should have on our surroundings, our environment. If we are living as citizens of the kingdom of God and witnessing to the kingdom that Jesus, the resurrected one, brought with him, if we are living by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the dough of our culture should begin to rise. That's the image. When Paul was preaching, it's interesting to me because the book of Acts in some places is very fast-paced, but in this passage in chapter 19, it says that Paul ministered in one place in the synagogue for three months, and he wasn't warmly received, so he changed his location and went all throughout Asia. And if you follow his trips, you can see how long he spent in Asia, and he was lecturing there at one point for two years, for two years. So it wasn't just an overnight thing. It was one holy foot in front of the other so that faithfulness happened day after day, word after word, relationship after relationship, and something very interesting happened because in that culture, they practiced sorcery. And it said that not everyone received the message. Not everyone believed. But that didn't deter Paul. Because many did believe, and those who believed started bringing their sorcery texts and burning them. The church changes culture. We were talking about in youth Sunday school when we had our impromptu lesson. Thank you, youth, for your patience and attendance. That Paul writes elsewhere in the New Testament, Awake, O sleeper. And when the church exists in culture, we are agents of change who go around waking people up by our influence. And, and as Paul writes in one letter, our quiet and gentle way of life, that people start to see our deeds and glorify our Father, that people start to hear our words, and people start to see and witness an alternative way of being and relating and treating other people. And they begin to wake up that maybe the way that I've been living or the things I've been doing or the practices I've been involved in really are not right. We wake up the moral conscience of the culture by just being there if we are who Jesus came to make us become. If we have the Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus' ministry and influence his words, actions, behaviors, lifestyle. I have been fond for quite a while now of the writings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And one of the quotes that has convicted me in recent years comes from a famous sermon of his called A Knock at Midnight. And I want to read uh, an abbreviated excerpt of that now. It says, The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. But if it does... It will enkindle the imagination of mankind and fire the souls of men and women, imbuing them with a glowing and ardent love for truth, justice, and peace. People far and near will know the church as a great fellowship of love that provides light and bread for lonely travelers at midnight. People far and near will know the church is a great fellowship of love that provides light and bread for lonely travelers at midnight. Wouldn't you love for that to be our reputation? Amen. Wouldn't you love for people to say that about us? Wouldn't you love for people to stand up and worship and say, I was the lonely traveler, and now I'm here now I'm one of you because you brought me in. You shared light with me. You gave bread to me. You showed me another way of living, another way of speaking, another way of relating to people, and you showed me the very life of Jesus. 
And now I testify that he has gotten hold of me, that I am his. We are called to be salt, light, and leaven, to hand out pink spoon samples of the kingdom of God that has arrived and is colliding in a greater and greater measure into what we already know as the present reality. And by living as windows into that kingdom, we change our culture around us. We, like the leaven Jesus describes, are to be a glorious injection of something that eradicates infection so that the diseases of our culture are cured by the healing that we bring. It causes a chemical alteration of the whole substance. And when heat is added to the reaction, it cannot be controlled by other outside influence. It intrigues me that the Bible describes the presence of the Holy Spirit so often with fire. Because if our culture is the dough, and Jesus says that we, his followers, are to be the yeast, then when you add the Holy Spirit, fire, heat, what do you get? Complete transformation of the whole substance. Our culture is the dough. Go to the next slide. I like this one. Yeah. So our culture is the dough. The followers of Jesus are the yeast, and the Holy Spirit brings the heat so that the culture is transformed by our presence, by the presence of the church. When I say this message, and, and I want you to know that I, I've, I've seen a lot of things on social media, and I've read a lot of news over the past week or two, and I wrote this sermon long before any of that. But I'm mindful today of the influence that culture has on the church and the influence, influence that the church is supposed to have on the culture. The culture does wake the church up to important issues that the gospel speaks into. But when the church starts to look like the culture so that the culture becomes the role model of the church, we have gotten something tragically backwards. Because the church is here to show the culture how God intends us to live. How God intends all of his creatures to be as we are conformed into the image of Christ by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're here for. And the thing about leaven is it takes over. <laughs> it takes over the dough. It doesn't make the dough cease to become dough, but it transforms it radically in a way that raises it to another level. We witness to the risen Lord whose Holy Spirit is inside us and working through us so that it affects the world around us. He transforms the people and places where we are because we're there. So I want to ask you a provocative question. If Robertsdale UMC went away tomorrow, would the community miss us? Would people notice our absence? And I celebrate, I'm, I'm coming up on one year of being your pastor and getting to know you and getting to fall in love with you and getting to know the church's story. And I am so thrilled and proud and humbled and delighted to be a part of a church where the answer to that question is yes. Yes, absolutely. If Robertsdale UMC were not here tomorrow, I know that the community would notice. The community would miss us. And maybe there are parts of that that the community's not even aware of because we are a gathering of agents of salt and light and yeast that pervade the community so that if the church wasn't here, that influence in other places wouldn't be here either. It's not just the tangible ministries we offer under the banner of Robert Stowe UMC because after all, I don't know if you remember this from a long time ago, but the church is not the building or the steeple, the church is the people, right? So, I celebrate that the answer to that question is yes, but at the same time, I think we always have to be challenged to realize that that question is never fully answered. We can always do more. There are always places that need to be reached. There, there's always work to be done. There's always change that needs to take place, and we are the ones who have been put here to do it. 
We are the ones who are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Our culture is not changed enough. We continue to pray week after week after week, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. More God, more God. So I want, you to, I want to invite you to respond to the message today where you are or if you want to come to the altars and spend some time in prayer, if you want to stand or sit during the closing hymn, sing, sing as you worship, pray reflectively. I want you to think of two questions as we pray and, and ask God to give us our response, to give us our assignment in response to this message. And the first is this. Where are the unleavened places in your sphere of influence? Where are the unleavened places? Do you know what unleavened means? It means the flat places. The places that need light and salt and yeast and life. Where are the unleavened places? Places that need to be affected by the good news of Jesus. And then question number two. Where and to whom... Is the Holy Spirit leading me to hand out pink spoon samples of the kingdom of God to change the culture around me? Where and to whom is the Holy Spirit leading me to hand out pink spoon samples? Come, Holy Spirit. 